Good evening and welcome to the September 2022 Game Dev Meeting of the International Game Developers Association Twin Cities Chapter, or IGDATC. My name is Beth, I am the Chair of IGDATC and your host for this evening. This is the intro. IGDATC board on our Discord. Our first presentation tonight is going to be creating equity, creating equality and equity in esports with Freya Mardquart. And then presentation number two will be um, about Landfest with Abuse Barbie and Firestorm 191. After the meeting, please feel free to join us in the Minneapolis or St. Paul room uh, for a little bit of post-meeting chatting like we used to do when we'd go over to Joe Sensors. So welcome. Our meetings are open to everyone, whether you are in the games industry or not. If you're a hobbyist or just someone who's simply interested in game development, you are more than welcome to tune in and hang out with us. Um, you can participate by asking questions and discussing with the attendees. Oh, I've been lost. Oh, no. Can you hear me now? Where'd you lose me? <laughs> At some point 20 seconds ago. Okay, so I'll just keep talking as if it's no big deal. Um, so you can always chime in um, in, it's not a Twitch chat anymore, we need to update this slide, the Discord or in the YouTube stream. Uh, IGDA is run by an all-volunteer board, Eli, myself, Mark, David, Zach, and Peter, but we can't do it alone. If you're interested in helping run our events and programs or making new ones, and if you have ideas to help us grow or improve, or if you're interested in serving on the board at some point, please contact us at our Gmail account. And speaking of volunteers, uh, I decided that we should actually recognize some of our volunteers, especially as we're starting to sort of consider shifting back into in-person for more of our events. Um, so this is Lane, Stephen, and Trevor. Uh, Lane does a lot of work with our playtest event. Um, Stephen is going to be running one of our special interest group gatherings, and Trevor has been instrumental in helping me with 2DCon and stuff like that. He does really good coordinating developer involvement at our events. Are you still in here to say hi, Trevor? Hey, everybody. <laughs> All right. So thank you, everybody. Uh, so we used to tell you don't worry about becoming an IGDA member, and you still don't have to worry about becoming an IGDA member. You're always welcome at our events. Um, but we do encourage you to consider a membership in the IGDA because it does eventually at some point kind of support our chapter. Uh, there are details about the benefits at IGDA.org. Um, I was told last time I didn't mention the dues are fairly reasonable. I think they're only $90 for two years, but they might have bumped it up to $100. I'm not 100% sure. But it isn't like a ridiculous amount of money like some professional organizations. So our regular schedule of events are always on Wednesdays except this month. So uh, you are at the game dev meeting on the second Wednesday. And then next Wednesday, we'll have our Twin Cities playtest event. But the fourth Wednesday, our Minnesota VR and HCI is actually on Thursday, the 29th this month. Um, I believe it's Bradley Ellenboss doing uh, some magic leap stuff. Uh, if you're in any of the Discord or Slack, you might have seen some of the videos that Bradley's been posting. It should be really fun and interesting, and that will be on YouTube, but also an in-person portion at REM5. So on to the plugs. We mentioned this last month, and I'm going to mention it one more time. Um, the Back to School Multiplayer Game Jam, sponsored by Global Game Jam and Photon. Um, the Global Game Jam Discord is going to have a lot of great help. Um, I think that that's actually where they're hosting the Photon developers and assistants. Um, if not, they will have a link on their Discord where you need to go. And speaking of Global Game Jam, 
Woo! They've announced the dates for 2023. Um, the prep week is the 23rd through the 27th of January. They will reveal the theme on the 28th or 29th, depending on where you live. And the jam week will be the 30th through the 5th. So we'll get to pick 48 hours anytime during that week. Um, our site details will be determined depending upon who is hosting us and how much our volunteers are able to put in time during the weekend. But I'm hoping that we'll have a full 48 hour open event. Uh, next one I got here is Games for Change, Diverse Voices and New Stories. Um, they have a little competition kind of thing going on right now to increase the visibility for mobile games by underrepresented developers. Creators are invited to submit their nearly or already completed Android games that have not yet been published. There's a $10,000 cash prize, $10,000 in advertising funds, and marketing expert help. Um, there's a link for you to check it out and submit that uh, entry. I will try to remember to put all of these things in the Discord when I'm done talking. And so last minute notice, hi everybody, um, this Friday, the 16th at 6.30 p.m. You can join us again on Discord um, for the Women in Games gathering. So I would like to invite all women in our community, regardless of your industry experience, um, to come and chit chat. Basically, uh, it's very informal because we're not meeting in person. I don't have any like speakers or programming or games, anything like that prepared. Um, but the topics that I plan to cover are talking about our latest projects, um, games that we're playing now, other industry topics that are of interest to people. Like, I don't know, there's tons of things we can talk about. Uh, it's basically just to kind of check in because I miss everybody. And it would be great to kind of have that uh, camaraderie that I kind of miss. And I don't know if Steven's here. I don't think I heard him log in. No, we don't have a Steven. All right, so the IGDATC POC get together. Uh, Stephen is hosting a meeting on the 24th from 1 to 6 p.m. at Noble Robot. Uh, the address is up here on that slide and the information for parking is really helpful because it is definitely nice. You can snag some free parking in certain areas around there. Um, also, I don't know anything about this, but somehow Stephen got sliced pizza to um, provide some pizza so if you have specific dietary concerns that you need or any questions uh, that's steven's email on the slide there um so if you are a person of color who is currently or previously in the industry a hobbyist or if you're just curious about the field he would be happy to have you there and then mark remember to unmute your microphone let's Hi. talk about co-working at noble robot I've done it. I've unmuted my microphone. Um, people in the chat can confirm. But yes, yeah, speaking of Noble Robot, uh, that's the uh, co-working space that I run um, here in Minneapolis. And uh, you can see some nice photos on the screen. But I'm here to pitch it to folks who are looking for a space to work that isn't at home. Say you have a remote work, uh, you're doing a remote work engagement, and you're getting a little bit uh, sick of uh, uh, working in your bedroom. Um, or you've got a little tiny studio you're starting, and you and someone else need a place to work together. Any per, any reason you might need it, uh, Noble Robot's here for you. We're a small co-working space. You can see the little bullet points, a bunch of cool features. We're bike friendly. There is free parking nearby, which is crazy for downtown Minneapolis. Um, we also watch Star Trek every week on Thursdays, and you can come be part of that. And it's like the best neighborhood in this city. I can't say enough good things about it. Restaurants, shops, all sorts of cool stuff, all within walking distance. Um, you can get all the information um, at noblerobot.com slash office. And I've got the prices here. Um, it is relatively cheap for a co-working space, partly because I'm not looking to make a profit on this endeavor. Um, so that's kind of my uh, uh, pitch. You're not going to get a better deal. Um, if you want a key to the place, which means you can just come in and work whenever you want, 24-7 access, but no dedicated desk. That's just $100 a month. Uh, if you want a dedicated desk all your own, you can leave all your crap here. Uh, that's $200 a month. So uh, again, uh, the... Um, the website's there for you to check out. And it also has links where you can schedule tours or uh, um, virtual chats with me if you have more questions. Uh, that's the whole deal. Oh, and Mark, you've got you've got glowing recommendations already. Lane says that working next to these people in the past was wonderful, can't recommend enough. You got Peter saying 10 out of 10 would co-work again. 
And I have to add my, like, the office space is really cool. It was a great little uh, adventure every time I come and visit. Now that I've gotten the parking down, it's uh, <laughs> actually a pleasure to visit Mark and co-work on some of the IGDA stuff when I go up there. Yeah. Um, so that's the, oh, that's the pitch I didn't make. That's the pitch I didn't <laughs> make. It's just the, the people who are here and the people who are part of this community, that, that's really what makes it great. Um, you know, forget the free tea and, you know, cool stuff on the walls. It's, it's, a, it's a great bunch of folks who... Uh, you, you'll be working next to. So that's that's the best pitch for it, really. Well, thank you, Mark. And I hope that you get some new coworkers so that I can visit for lunch again. <laughs> All right. And if there is anything else if that you want to plug for next month, please let us know. You can email us at igdatwincities at gmail.com. You can send us a message on Discord. Uh, whatever you would like to share with the community. May I jump in really quick on that before we jump to the next presentation? Yes, there, do Thank it. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter. Uh, I'm one of the, I'm the treasurer here at the IGDA Two Cities chapter, and I have some unfortunate news that uh, I know. That last last month we had made announcements that we wanted to do some volunteering with the uh, Minnesota Minnesota Esports Club with the Twins at Target Field. And unfortunately, we couldn't get those volunteer dates booked out in time. So I know that we had a handful of you people that were interested in volunteering, which I thank you very much for. But I would say stay tuned because those dates that were, we know we could get it this month, we are aiming to get it uh, next year in 2023. So uh, with uh, our steadfast, steadfast planning, we will make these events better. Um, but with that said, uh, I know that we have also haven't announced our own uh, Global Game Jam site, but we are, of course, looking for volunteers to run said Global Game Jam as well. So if you're interested in still, uh, volunteering for any of those opportunities, of course, reach out to us at uh, our email address listed on the slide right there, uh, igdhwincities at gmail.com. And uh, just tag Peter and say, would love to volunteer. And I look forward to working with you soon. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Peter. I was wondering who else chimed in there. Like I heard the someone joined the channel, but I wasn't sure. Now it explains it. Uh, yes, definitely. We are slightly disappointed. Uh, I, I'm only I'm going to admit I wasn't like super duper disappointed because I wasn't really excited to spend every weekend of this month out at Target Field. But next year, I'm excited to either have our own volunteer force or be helping back out up there. So definitely. Thank you for reminding me, Peter. All right, so we're going to move into our presentations now, I think. Final final answer. Just going to double check. Yep, I don't see. Oh, there's someone in the general discussion. Nope. Oh, Peter was just linking the things for me. Thank you so much. All right, so I will hand it over then to Freya. Thank you so much, Beth. Uh, hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Um, this is going to be a little bit different for me because I'm used to doing a lot more of these types of talks in person. Uh, so bear with me as I kind of stumble through not looking for as much audience feedback as I normally would, although I do have chat up. So if any of you all uh, end up having anything you need to say or want me to respond or clarify further as I'm going, feel free to toss something in the chat. And if I spot it as I'm going, I'll try to pull it out while we go. Um, although I do also have a section at the end for uh, some additional questions. And, and just double checking, Beth, uh, how much time do I have on the clock to work with here? Because uh, honestly, this is a topic I can rant about for hours. <laughs> uh, I said about an hour, so a little bit more, a little bit less. Either way is okay. okay. Perfect. Plan out about I'll, 60 uh, minutes. I'll try to keep it under that just so we have uh, time to get questions and everything uh, before we head out. So. Talking about uh, creating equality and equity in esports, I'm going to kind of shift it slightly and talk about it more as for gaming as a whole, because uh, it, it doesn't necessarily just apply to esports. Uh, and there's a, a few bits in here that I have that talk specifically about the game industry as a whole, rather than just focusing directly on esports. So if you're not a big esports fan, you know nothing about esports, don't worry, I'll do everything I can to make it as relatable as possible as we go. So, I think the biggest thing that we need to start off with talking about whenever we talk about equality and equity in esports is what is the actual definitions of those words? Because I think there's a lot of uh, confusion for people on what the difference between equity and equality is. 
So when we're talking about equity, we're talking about the quality of being fair and impartial. So, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is going to get the exact same treatment. Uh, if you end up giving some sort of financial disbursement to help people out, for example, and you give uh, somebody who has zero income $500, they're obviously going to blow through that very, very quickly uh, on just things that they need, like food, shelter, whatever. If you give $500 to someone who already is making thousands in a week, uh, they're probably just going to be able to take that money and invest it and create a profit off of the money. So there's not, uh, th there's a bit of a difference between, you know, trying to treat everybody equally and trying to give equitable uh, changes. So then we have equality, which is the state of being equal, especially in status, rights, and opportunities. So, you know, generally speaking, kind of the same example I just gave. Uh, I personally just love this picture, though, for uh, kind of showing a bit of a bigger picture on what equity looks like. You know, obviously with this, there's more rocks on one side than there is on the other, but because of the placement of that stick across the rock on the bottom, it creates an equal balance because you need additional weight on one side to equal out the other side with leverage. <clears throat> so one thing that's always generally talked about in esports is that it's, uh, it's kind of an amazing thing because it can be an equal playing field in a perfect world. <laughs> and I think that's the part that gets left out a lot is that in a perfect world, esports would be kind of the great equalizer when it comes to uh, any kind of athletics, really. Uh, you know, generally speaking, your physical makeup shouldn't determine anything about whether or not you're able to perform better in the games that you're playing. Your height doesn't matter. Your weight doesn't matter. Your race, gender, and religion, all those things should not matter to the performance that you're able to put out in whatever game you're playing. So, you know, of course we all know that there are certain things about that statement that makes it so those things aren't necessarily equal in gaming. Um, for example, if you were born in a specific area of the world where uh, certain religious indoctrinations or uh, even laws of the area make it so that you as a woman are unable to play or compete in any type of sports, then you're obviously going to have a, a much larger disadvantage in trying to enter into that. Um, you know, one of the things that I've brought up before is uh, when I had been asked in the past uh, whether or not women had an actual disadvantage in esports, uh, it was a resounding yes because of the lack of entry points that they have like generally speaking uh, and you, again this is going to be very broad generalizations but uh one thing that a lot of women experience is that growing up they might be told that they are not allowed to play video games but the boys are allowed to play video games and i have never personally heard of a community where women are allowed to play the video games and the men aren't allowed to play video games and it's just minor things like that that do make a major impact in the long run. So one of the other things that gets brought up a lot, uh, especially when we're talking about gender in esports and gaming as a whole, is isn't gaming a 50-50 split on the gender population? And we're going to look at three different regions for this example, uh, US, Asia, and EU. Uh, and those are just kind of broadly speaking about uh, you know, USA is really more so talking about North America as a whole. It's not just specifically United States. Uh, Asia is all of the Asia Pacific region. EU is all of the European countries. Um, but in USA, North America, roughly 45% of gamers identify as women. And when you consider the fact that there are gamers out there who might be uh, identifying as non-binary or some other variety of gender on the gender spectrum, that is pretty close to a 50-50. In the Asian regions, it is very, very similar. It's, again, roughly 45% of gamers. 308 million of those come from China alone. There is a ton, a ton of women in gaming in China. And in EU, it's even bigger. There's 47% of European gamers identifying as women. So, you know, we are very, very close to a 50-50 split on the gender lines as far as the population of who all plays video games. But there's a lot of problems still. Um, and I'm sure that many of you who are here watching uh, or who might be watching this later 
are probably aware of some of these, but uh, going to just kind of go over them briefly, trying to uh, create a little bit of context for those who might not know. There's extreme gaps across the gaming industry, uh, whether that's wage gaps, uh, disparity in uh, the distribution of racial groups amongst different fields, et cetera. Um, you know, female esports players make only 0.05% of what male players earn on average, and that's coming from Forbes. And I just want that to take a moment to sink in for a second. 0.05% of what male players earn. So every dollar that male players earn, women in the same esport doing the same things that they are doing will make a nickel. <laughs> and, you know, obviously that gets a bit more staggering as you bring things up. So that's, you know, if someone is making a hundred dollars with a woman is making five dollars. If it's a thousand dollars, a woman is making fifty dollars. And it the bigger you make those numbers, the more it starts to look like more of a wage canyon than a wage gap. Hence the picture on the side there. And you know that in itself is pretty staggering, especially considering that also, you know, we have nearly half of women or half of the population of gamers is women. Nearly half of the industry employees are also women. And the wage gap there is unfortunately growing. We are seeing an increase over the years uh, of men getting promoted into higher positions and women kind of being left in the um, entry level and just like low management positions. Over half of professional esports players are white. That is weird when you think about what we had talked about just a slide ago, where you know you have 308 uh, million people uh, in China alone who are women playing the game. Uh, you know, the most of the gaming industry is, is actually from Asian countries. Uh, most gamers are from Asian countries, that is. Uh, I, I'd actually seen a chart. I unfortunately did not think to include it in these slides, but it listed off all of the populations of gamers across the world. And uh, the interesting thing about that was that Asia Pacific had more players than EU, Middle Eastern, and Africa, uh, South America, and North America combined. So all of the other major regions that people generally think of in gaming combined don't make up as much of the, the gaming space as Asian countries. However, there are less Asians in professional esports than there are people who are white. Uh, and, you know, obviously n there's a lot of systemic issues that uh, are involved in all of these things. Uh, and we'll get into more about that a little bit later. But there's also a lot of poor representation. That's another big problem that we see in gaming, and I think a lot of people have probably talked about uh, in the past. You all might be very familiar with it. But these were some stats that I found incredibly interesting in that regard, which is that 47% of all adults across all races responded that they are not sure whether or not video games portrayed minority groups poorly. And only 20% could agree that minority groups are definitely treated poorly in most games. But what I see when I see that is, you know, uh, from a, a backed up perspective, you're like, oh, well, 47% and 20%, that's still under half, right? Well, what we're really seeing here is that that means 67% of people cannot say with certainty that minority groups are represented well in games. Over half of adults know that they can't say with 100% certainty minority groups are represented well in games. And similarly, 40% say they weren't sure if women are portrayed poorly, while 14% say it's true for most games that they are portrayed poorly. So again, over half of adults uh, in America recognize that women are portrayed poorly in gaming, or at least not portrayed well enough that they could say, yeah, they're portrayed very well. I think that they're portrayed accurately and with respect. Another one of the big issues that we see in gaming, and especially in esports, is financial barriers to entry. Obviously, if you're going to try to get into esports, it is 
uh, best to have the best hardware that you can. But minority groups are more likely to buy game consoles over a gaming PC due to the gap in prices between the two. Um, obviously, we could talk about this all day of how, due to redlining and various other uh, systemic issues, various mar minority and marginalized groups are likely to be uh, receiving a lower income than uh, like a cis white male home. And to all the cis white men out there, I really apologize. I am not trying to come after you. I was once considered a cis white male myself uh, until I came out as trans. <laughs> just know that like this isn't anyone trying to come after you. This is just saying that this is what the stats are. And the numbers don't lie. Uh, and, you know, there's also a lot of poor reporting processes. So obviously there's a lot of stories out there. Uh, I think if you talk to any woman, trans woman, minority uh, group of any kind, various races, whatever, and you ask them what their worst experience is in, in playing online games, uh, especially competitively playing online games, they're going to probably ask you how much time you have to listen to all the things that have happened to them. Or at the very least, they are going to give you their worst story, and it is going to blow you away. <laughs> and the number of complaints received through various reporting systems in these online games is immense. And, you know, sure, there, there's definitely bound to be some of those reports from people uh, where maybe they just were upset that they lost, and they were trying to make their opponent somehow get in trouble for something that never happened. And generally speaking, a lot of automated services are able to just kind of throw those things out. Uh, but the ones who are reporting accurately the, the things that are happening to them don't feel like their reports are being taken seriously. Um, you know, I, I think I'm going to talk about Rocket League quite a bit uh, during this presentation because that is my favorite game. That is the, the eSport that I uh, have competed in for years now. And... Um, so in Rocket League, that is one of the games that when you fill out a report and something does happen, you do get a response back from the game developers. When you end up loading up your game, uh, after they have taken action, you'll get a pop-up notification on your screen that says something along the lines of, thank you for your report. Uh, action has been taken against the uh, player uh, in question based on feedback from you and your peers. Uh, and that's great. That, that is a good start, but that's still a very, very vague response to give. Um, for example, I don't know if that message is talking about somebody who I reported last night or if it's talking about somebody who I reported for something three months ago. Uh, I don't know if that person is now banned from competing in the game uh, or if they have just been given a, a mute to their chat functions for a day. You know, the, there's no real way to uh, find out transparently what happened there. However, I, I do think that that is a much better step than some other games do, such as, uh, like, you know, I'm sure lots of people in, especially in game developer industry right now, have heard uh, a lot of complaints about the way 343 is running Halo Infinite. And one of the biggest complaints that I've seen from players about Halo Infinite is that there is no reporting whatsoever. They, they didn't implement a single way to report bad actors. Uh, and there are a lot of things that are very obviously done there. Like, you know, if someone's talking to you through voice and they are just screaming obscenities or racial slurs or whatever, you have no way of reporting that other than recording it yourself from uh, some sort of device that you have on your system and then uploading it to Twitter or wherever and hoping that the community just kind of like ostracizes that individual, uh, which is not a good way to handle a community, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, that is just uh, a few things to think about. And I think that these are all very, very important problems to remember as game developers uh, going into trying to make your own online uh, situations for people to be involved with. And so what's the solution to all of that? I'm going to be honest and say that the solutions at face value sound 
uh, dumb <laughs> because to be honest, the, the solutions are kind of obvious when you just put the, the problems into perspective of what they are, uh, like we just did, which is, you know, we need to close the gaps. We need to create better representation. We need to create equal cost points of entry. We need to create better systems of reporting. That all sounds simple enough, right? But we, we all know that it's a bit more complex than that. Uh, like I, for example, don't have any power on my own to close any wage gaps that currently exist in the gaming industry because I am not personally employing anybody into the gaming industry. And even if I was in a position where I did, likely the budget is not controlled by me. So these are a lot of things that just kind of need to be adopted by the people who are in positions of power. And I think that the best way that we can do that is to continue talking about it like we are today and just making sure all of that information is heard. Apologies for the buzzer that just went off in the background. Uh, not sure who's at my door, but they can. <laughs> Creating better representation in games, that's going to fall on uh, the game developers themselves. Uh, but it's also going to fall on the people who are hiring different content creators for different events, uh, the people who are hiring uh, shoutcasters for esports events or hosts for things. Uh, if you have multiple candidates who all have very, very equal resumes, uh, just I, I don't know how to say this any more bluntly than don't go with the person who just sounds like they are most like you. Go with the person who you think is the most different from you. Uh, and, you know, I think that can go for pretty much any job. Like, I think that we all have a, a tendency to want to work with people who are of the same mindset as ourselves. But it's going to be much more beneficial if we are able to work with people who have very different perspectives and very, very different viewpoints from our own so that we can learn from them, so that we can have somebody question our own perspective. And so you can have a uh, good dialogue about those serious topics. Creating equal cost points of entry. Again, that's something that a lot of us here have very little control over. I don't control the cost of PC components or how much uh, Xbox is going to be releasing their newest console for. Uh, but what we do have control over in the game developer world is whether or not we make our games in a way where they're able to be released on multiple platforms. So I think it's important to try to spread games across multiple platforms as much as possible to give people multiple price, multiple price points that they can enter into that game at, especially in esports, where you are trying to get competitors uh, of varying backgrounds. Uh, another thing that could be done is creating events that are just for console players. Uh, I think that one thing that's not taken into account for enough is that, generally speaking, if you have a console player versus a PC player of an equal skill level, the PC player uh, who is playing on a 140 hertz monitor, for example, is going to likely have a better reaction time than the console player who is playing on a 60 hertz TV screen because it's just going to be a slower. Uh, refresh rate that they have so they see things slower than the person who has the better monitor. <clears throat> and then, of course, creating better systems for reporting. That's going to, again, fall on a lot of the game developers. And I understand that in a lot of the bigger studios, there's a lot of red tape on different things and there's a lot of hoops to jump through. But just keep on pushing and doing everything that you can to make those things happen. And that's kind of the the, the whole of all of this, right? Is we might not, as individuals, have the ability to change any of these things by ourselves, but if we keep pushing for those changes, we keep talking about those changes and the necessity for those, then we can start to create those discussions in the right places. So when you're going through and you're trying to make all of these different changes in the existing landscape, how do you know whether or not you're making the right move or the wrong move? Uh, you know, that's something that comes up a lot is people want to help out, but they stop themselves from making any movement 
because they're afraid to make the wrong move. And the biggest thing I can say to that is we need to stop being afraid and we need to start moving. If you let fear freeze you, nothing is going to change. Figure since we're talking about all these serious topics, I might as well throw one meme into the mix uh, in the middle of this presentation. And you know, it's just, how do you know if you're doing the right thing? That's the neat part. You don't. Uh, nobody has all of the answers. And, and it doesn't matter how much research you do, you're never going to have exactly all of the information that you want. Uh, one of the things that I always tell members of my teams that I work with is one thing that they need to understand and be patient of when they're working with any kind of supervisor of any kind, any kind of team lead of any kind, is generally speaking that when you're in a leadership position, you are forced to make decisions with about 2% of the information that you actually want to have before making that decision. But you know that it is more deadly for you to not make a decision than it is for you to just flip that coin and hope you got the right choice or at least the better choice of the two options in the, in the situation. <clears throat> so how do you know a fear of failure or fear in general is holding you back from anything. Uh, maybe maybe it's holding you back from making decisions. Maybe it's holding you back from trying to implement changes that will actually produce some good in the world uh, and some some much needed changes. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different things that we can go over with this. Uh, future feeling hopeless. You know, if if you constantly feel like, oh, well, I guess we're just stuck in this situation. There's nothing I can do to change it. Uh, that type of mentality generally is a sign that you are just afraid of failing to make changes. If you're chronically worried about anything, <laughs> anything at all, really, uh, that's also a good indication that some sort of fear, uh, whether that's fear of failure or fear otherwise, is holding you back from doing something. Uh, being worried about disappointing others kind of falls into that same thing. Frequently procrastinating. If you uh, are constantly finding yourself going off and doing other tasks, uh, or you know, this one kind of goes hand in hand with that, if you're easily pulled away from what you're doing by irrelevant things, like maybe you're saying, oh, well, I really need to finish uh, making that proposal, but oh, gee, there's a, a stack of dishes in the kitchen over there. I can't let that sit. I need to get that cleaned up before the, the pets get into it. You know, th those types of distractions are just good indications that you are afraid of not adequately performing the way that you'd like to. And uh, I apologize if my camera is slowly getting darker. I'm using some natural light out my window. Uh, so it is going to continue to darken as we go on. <laughs> but um, you know, avoiding people who are associated with your projects or goals, that's another one that's a, a good indication that there's some fear involved. Uh, but then there's also some very real physical effects that you might be experiencing. Maybe you're constantly feeling fatigued, you're getting headaches, you're having digestive troubles, uh, pain, whether that's joint pain, muscle pain, et cetera, <clears throat> et cetera. Uh, those things can all be indications that you are chronically feeling anxious or uh, in fear of something and that you need to just make some sort of movement happen. And I know that's a lot easier said than done in some cases. Executive function is a very real thing, and uh, it's not always easy to overcome executive dysfunction, uh, but you have to make some kind of movement. Fear is very heavily tied in with your body's fight or flight responses, uh, tied in with your nervous system, tied in with a lot of different things. And your body, and your mind uh, having a lot of these, you know, weird instincts from uh, an old world when we weren't all sitting behind desks like this all the time, doesn't know necessarily uh, what the stimulus is that's triggering it. Whether you logically know it or not, you cannot communicate that to your nervous system. So doing some kind of movement, whether that is, uh, you know, some kind of exercise, um, hitting a boxing bag, whatever, that will then end up relieving a bit of that stress because now you have triggered that response that your body was looking for of, oh, well, I ran, so I did the flight, so now I can calm down. I, I hit a boxing bag a couple of times, so that was my fight response actually 
going off. Uh, so that can calm down now. And that's just going to be a way that you could also help to uh, relieve some of these symptoms a bit quicker. And you know, there's a lot of different ways to overcome your fears. We all want to be that person who is just uh, standing at the peak, looking down at everything, going like, wow, I did that. I made that happen. I, I overcame a lot of stuff, and now we're here. This is awesome. Uh, <laughs> but you know, to do that, we need to check in with what I like to call your fear inventory. Uh, these are essentially just some tools that you can utilize to help yourself fight against your fears. Um, one of the biggest ones is doing primary source research. Uh, whenever possible, don't make a guess. Talk to people in the communities who you're trying to help or you are trying to depict in your games or you are trying to do whatever with. Um, don't, don't make guesses when it comes to people's lives. Uh, don't go based on knowledge you have from stereotypes. Just do what you can to talk to actual people who are actually living that experience and getting the best possible result that is the closest to that lived experience. Um, and you know, another good thing to keep in mind to help combat your fear is that everything in the world changes. And that's terrifying <laughs> in some aspects, right? But the one thing that we do know is that you can always A-B test things, and it doesn't matter what all changes around you because you can always change with it. Uh, if anyone here has done any marketing in the past or anything like that, you're probably very familiar with A-B tests. Uh, you take the two best ideas you have and you pit them against each other. Uh, and you just send them out to your audience. Uh, first person who gets there will see test A. Second person who gets there will see test B. And it just goes back and forth like that until you see what the results are of that test. Once you have the, your results, you can say, oh, well, the B test really beat out the A test here. So then the B is your new champion, and that is going to be your A test for your next set. Constantly come up with new ideas. Constantly be testing those things. Constantly pit your ideas against your old ideas. See which one outperforms the other. And then rinse and repeat. And keep those old ideas somewhere. Don't, don't get rid of them, because maybe it didn't work out in the moment that you had tried it first. But maybe it just wasn't the right time for it. Uh, maybe your B test in test one defeated your A test, but then down at test four, your original A test from test one will beat the B test from test four. And you know, just constantly mixing and matching all these different ideas, seeing which one performs better is going to be a good way to uh, learn from mistakes and learn from failures. Uh, and that's another thing too, is being afraid of failure freezes people up a lot but failure is the only way we learn anything you're not going to learn anything new if you just keep on winning all the time and uh one thing that i had to learn to get myself out of a lot of ruts uh i actually had a couple of years in my life where i was homeless was learning how to ask for help learning how to figure out coping skills for myself and uh being comfortable with going through and reading self-help material we can't all afford therapy in the United States. Uh, unfortunately, that is not something that all of us have covered for us. But I think that the majority of us can all likely afford some kind of a help, self-help book, which has been written by therapists. Uh, the book cover I have here, Get Out of Your Own Way, Overcoming Self-Defeating Behavior, uh, was a, a book that is something that has helped me a lot personally in recognizing a lot of my own self-defeating behaviors and recognizing a lot of the things that I was doing uh, to kind of just stop myself from moving forward when I needed to. And I will admit, uh, this book has a lot of anecdotes in it, which are likely just kind of made up on the spot to make a point. Uh, but there is a lot of good points in the book. The, the therapists who spent their time working on this uh, did uh, a lot of good research over the years and it has uh, a lot of good points if you want to check it out. Uh, no, I am not in any way sponsored by this book. This is not an advertisement for them. This is just me as a person, as a friend coming to you and saying, hey, this is a book I found really helpful. Maybe you will too. Um, so we're just going to move on from that. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about some real world examples quick. Again, um, 
I did a lot of competition in Rocket League. I have helped host a lot of events there. So there's going to be some talk of those types of events here. Uh, but these are going to be some events which were essentially testing grounds for me to figure out how can we continue to push the boundaries and continue to help uh, women and other marginalized genders in gaming. Uh, the first event that we're going to talk about is eGirl CS. This was the first ever women's only Rocket League event, and I'm sure that just based on the name alone, you can all probably tell that it had some problems with it. <laughs> um, following that was the Women's Carball Championship. That was the event that I had worked with from seasons one through season three over the past two years and built that up. And then we'll, we'll finish off talking about the Overwatch Empowerment Cup, which was a Overwatch event that was designed to be an entry point to spotlight all marginalized genders within the game. Um, so we'll just touch on those very quickly. So first Rocket League event ever that was for women it was made by Drama R Alert. Uh, as you can tell by the name there, Drama R Alert was essentially a social media account dedicating to uh, spreading gossip and drama around the Rocket League community. And that was their main form of content creation. Um, you know, nothing, uh, I have nothing against anyone who is making that type of content. I know it is a, a very profitable, <laughs> profitable business for a lot of people. Uh, but I will say that as a, a means of moving things forward, it's not incredibly effective. <laughs> um, so eGirl CS was essentially an event created by them with the intentions of sparking more drama in the community. Um, registration was open worldwide. There was a $500 prize pool, which again, going back to that 0.05% uh, <laughs> number that we talked about earlier, uh, $500 for an event is rather small. Um, with the amount of people who entered, there was a, they were able to make two groups of seven teams and do a round robin best of three. For those who don't know what robin, round robin is, that is where every single team in the group has to go up against each other. Uh, and so they played best of three. So whoever won two out of the three games won that match. Uh, top four from each of those groups went on to the winner's bracket, and the prize was paid out to the top three teams. I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, but I think it was something like the first place team had $200, uh, or no, they had $250. Uh, second place team had 150 and the third place team had whatever was left of that. Uh, like I said, I can't remember the exact split, but again, when each team of Rocket League players is a team of three, even $250 split between three people for an entire event like that is uh, a very small amount. So one thing that ended up being kind of a massive issue with this event was that open registration worldwide. Um, they didn't really have any sort of security in place to make sure that the people who were entering the event were actually the marginalized group that it was aimed at. Um, and what ended up happening from that is one of the players who did win part of the prize money did end up making a detransitioning post um, very shortly after winning the event. So essentially, they went in claiming to be transgender. Uh, they got their money paid out, and within a week after that, they essentially just said, hey, I'm not actually trans, I'm a guy, uh, but you can't take this money away from me because I already have it. And uh, that was kind of one of the worst fears that a lot of people have, because, you know, as we've seen even in, like, the Olympics today and everything, there's a lot of people who kind of do some witch hunting for trans people. They will even go as far as, you know, claiming that cisgender women who have been winning these events for years uh, suddenly are, are definitely trans and definitely had more testosterone than the rest of the players and that's why they were able to do better and blah 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 and it's it's a whole mess and so we want to do everything that we can to avoid those sorts of things um, one of the things that also happened with this event was that everyone who was a part of it had to join a discord server in order to play um, I think they were just trying to bolster up the numbers of their Discord server. Uh, 
because uh, I believe they were kind of doing uh, a bit of a, a scheme of pumping up the numbers on all of their accounts. And then they had uh, later on sold this account to someone else. And uh, it is now sold off to one of the groups who is like kind of one of the more reputable sources of uh, news and rumors uh, in Rocket League now uh, shift. But anyway, uh, after all of that, you know, obviously there was a lot of people who were very upset, very angry that the event was kind of soiled the way that it was. Uh, it was already a very small prize pool to begin with, but then to find out that part of that prize was run away with by someone who wasn't supposed to be into the competition to begin with uh, left a really bad taste in people's mouths. So what happened from there was the Women's Carball Championship was created. Um, Women's Carball Championship was an idea come up with by a few of the women in Rocket League who were working with an organization called Crimson Wings at the time. Uh, Crimson Wings was very well known in the community for hosting weekly and monthly events, so hosting tournaments was just kind of their thing. Um, a lot of the women who were very uh, good competitors in the game brought up their concerns and brought up their ideas to the owner of Crimson Wings, and uh, they took those ideas and they said, all right, let's try it. And Luckily, it, it went very well. I ended up joining in along with them uh, in Season 1. Um, we had gotten together a pool of players uh, to really get an idea of like what rules everyone felt would be fair to implement, um, what types of a, a verification service would be fair for everyone to have to go through to prove their identity. Um, and be able to compete in the competition without um, really invading privacy too heavily. And we built an entire community around the Women's Carball Championship. It was not just a one-off event. Uh, we had grown the server uh, on Discord to nearly a 1,000 individuals. Um, we implemented a verification system, which made it so that you could have your players who are competitors uh, brought into separate spaces of the server than the people who were fans of the event and who just wanted to be there to support and root everybody on. Um, we also implemented a zero tolerance policy for toxicity in the community because, let's face it, why would we want a whole community of people who have been ostracized and people who have been uh, looked down on to just continue that behavior with each other? Uh, so we committed to four moral pillars, which were grow, improve, encourage, and shine. Essentially, we wanted to help each other grow uh, as competitors, as managers, as uh, coaches, whatever it is that you wanted to do. We wanted to create a route for people to be able to grow in those spaces within our event. We wanted everyone to be able to have opportunities to improve on their skills. We wanted everyone to encourage each other in everything that they did and make it so that all of us could end up having... Uh, a wonderful production, wonderful competition where we could all shine outwardly to the community and have a spotlight on every single one of our players. And I think that generally speaking, we were pretty successful in doing that. We we made a lot of changes between seasons one, two, three, and four. We had constantly taken a lot of uh, community feedback on everything that we did. We got a lot of that primary resource information and made changes accordingly. Uh, we were able to slowly increase prize pools over time. Uh, we ended up having one season that was split between uh, EU and NA because we had enough teams from both regions to be able to do that. Uh, we then, the next season, had realized that it would be more beneficial to split it between an upper division of players and a lower division of players rather than dividing it, <laughs> dividing it by region. And I believe that that's going to be their plans going into season five as well. Um, we sought out sponsorship. We we ended up getting sponsored by Psionics, the game developer of Rocket League, for season three of the event, and uh, we created a lot a lot of opportunities for a lot of casting talent who had been completely unheard of uh, at the time. And a lot of those individuals are now going on to making a full career out of those things. Um, now. How did we come up with all of this stuff? Again, we we just guessed. We didn't know if any of this stuff that we were doing was going to work out or not, but we continually tested things. We continually said, okay, let's try this, see how it goes, 
And if that doesn't work, let's take feedback and make changes and see what can happen. Um, Women's Carball Championship has now uh, rebranded. Uh, they are now just uh, in the women's uh, carball community. It's just like WCB instead of WCBC now, uh, as they are trying to grow uh, even further. Um, and I think that it's going to be incredible to watch and see what they do as they continue to try to be a space to develop uh, women in that sector of esports. Um, so one thing that happened kind of during one of the seasons of that was the Overwatch Empowerment Cup. Um, I had started working for this company called Vite Ramen, where I'm still working today. And uh, while I was working there, there was that announcement that there was going to be a $500,000 event for, um, I think it was CSGO players, if I'm remembering correctly, um, that was going to be hosted by... Um, hosted at DreamHack and all that. And so it was a, a big event. They had a LAN, all that. Very cool stuff. But when that happened, it created a massive uproar in the Overwatch community who didn't understand why there was necessarily a need for women's events and uh, why there was a need to create equitable opportunities for women to grow and improve their skills outside of the normal competitions. Um, so our social media, the manager at the time, is uh, a 17 year old guy and i you know i really respect uh everything that he did for this but uh there there were some mistakes made uh he had brought up the idea to our ceo of hey uh you know seeing all these guys talking about how they hate this idea or whatever i think it would be awesome if we created an overwatch event for women or marginalized genders uh, just kind of like to spite them. And my C our CEO said, well, that's a great idea. And so the 17-year-old social media manager, not knowing any better, immediately went and tweeted out saying, hey, we're going to be running this event <laughs> with zero planning on the table. Uh, luckily, I already had my experiences with the Women's Cowball Championship uh, to, to kind of fall back on to have an idea of some things that we could do for this. But we had to move very, very quickly. And this was the event that had the most fear and stress out of anything that I have ever done for myself personally. Because I had played a total of about 30 minutes of Overwatch in my entire life. Uh, the game was not the same game as it was even when I played it because I had played it years ago. I had no concept of anything in it. I knew very few people in that community who knew the game well. And I was incredibly unfamiliar with <laughs> tournament licensing with blizzard with rocket league it's easy or at least it was easy at the time you could just go and run an event and as long as you weren't charging anybody any money to enter into the event you were pretty much in the clear uh blizzard however has a lot more red tape on running an event and you have to apply for tournament licensing you have to follow a lot of different uh types of guidelines whether you're a community event or whether you're getting custom licensing whatever i knew none of that stuff uh, but again, I knew that we had to move and we needed to move quick in order to actually make this happen. And if it failed, then it failed. But I wasn't going to go back on that promise that was made under our brand's account of having this event happen. Uh, and the event needed to get started way faster than I felt any event ever should be started. Uh, although I should also mention that because of the experiences of having to rush this event uh, I did kind of learn a lot of different tactics about how to create an event very, very quickly in a very, very short amount of time. And I then ended up later creating uh, other events for other people in time frames even smaller. Uh, and so, you know, it was a big learning curve, but it was uh, a great experience. And we had some incredible outcomes from it. Within the first week of opening up the Discord community for that, I created the community based off of the shell of what we had done for the Wins Carball Championship. We had 800 uh, individuals join within the first two weeks, and we had seen over 1,000 individuals join before the event uh, had even started. There were 64 teams who entered into the event, and that is five players plus a sub on each team. So that's six players times 64 teams. That's a lot of people. Um, we had gotten a lot of notice from Blizzard. Uh, as many people in the game developing industry might be aware, Blizzard doesn't exactly have the best track record uh, when it comes to things on the topics of marginalized genders. 
Um, and they were watching every move that we made and they were learning from us. They brought their community uh, directors into our Discord server and they had even emailed me personally a lot after the event to find out more about how exactly I ran things um, because they wanted to know how they could do better and be better in the future because we showed in very, very short order. Uh, I think it was about two and a half months from start of planning to the event going live uh, that this was a massive part of their community and that there was a lot of people who were very interested in this. And, uh, you know, it just was something that was proven to be worth their time and worth their money to actually uh, do something about. Uh, they ended up putting our event on the Blizzard uh, Games launcher. They put our, our event on their website. They spent resources having their community managers go through forums and actually explain the importance of equity and inclusion to all of the people who were making horrible comments on their forum posts. Uh, we raised over $4,000 for the event for the prize pool, and we had raised money to pay out all of the production, all of the uh, casters, everyone who was designing things for this event. It was a fully paid out event uh and we paid people their worth uh and that isn't something that generally happens in these spaces especially on a first time event but from the success of this uh overwatch and blizzard entertainment ended up deciding to continue on with these sorts of events they did the overwatch 2 uh twitch rivals pride celebration in support of the trevor project and they have even more events coming on the horizon uh i'm sure uh i i probably know a bit more than i'm supposed to about that so i will just leave it at that but i i would say keep an eye on blizzard in the coming months because i would guarantee that they're going to be putting out more things like this so kind of the summary of all this is that you know there is a lot of work to be done i think we're all aware of that anyone who is a part of any minority group is aware of that anyone who has ever gone outside and spoken to anyone in a minority group for any amount of time is probably well aware of that <laughs> but the thing is we just need to do our best to overcome our own fears and we need to actually get moving on making these changes because small and consistent efforts over time are going to yield incredible results and will likely be uh, even greater than you may have ever even anticipated yourself so uh, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate all of you who are here live watching and listening to all this. I appreciate every single one of you who ends up coming and watching this later. Uh, again, my name is Freya Marcorn. Uh, you can feel free to send me an email, contact at freyahays.com. Uh, check out my website, freyahays.com, if you ever want to work with me and want to get in contact with me in some way there. Uh, by all means, go right ahead. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, I would be more than happy to give some answers to those questions at this time. I'm gonna monitor chat for just <laughs> a minute here. <laughs> yeah, definitely, um, definitely. But I wanna thank you, that was an awesome presentation. Uh, I love the the reporting I was just thinking when you were talking about the reporting part, like I get this mm -hmm. lovely notification. I used to play a lot of Overwatch and I'd get a notification that would say, thank you for your report. Some action was taken. And it was like, which of the eight people last night is that? Or right. is it someone from another day? Like, <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, I, I think it would be so fantastic if we were able to be more transparent with people specifically about like what actions were taken or which report specifically. Even if you're able to just like, Maybe you don't want to give them uh, a name. Maybe you can just like give them a report number and they can, you know, look up the ticket for their report or something. Uh, but, you know, uh, obviously I'm not a game developer myself. I don't know all the ins and outs of uh, the complexities of that. Just a person here throwing out ideas where I can. How long is a normal uh, tournament planning duration since the 2.5 months was so short? So, for typical events that I had done previously to that, uh, we would spend about four to six months actually getting all the planning done, getting sponsorships, uh, uh, doing our best to acquire sponsorships at least, because uh, you do need to pitch uh, 
all the sponsors to get funding for events, uh, especially if you are a smaller organization and you don't have the financial means to run it yourself. Uh, obviously, bigger events that are actually run by the game developers themselves and things like that can take a shorter time period because they already have all the money they could ever want and need to do those things. But when you are a grassroots event that is starting from the ground up, two and a half months is incredibly short. And um, especially as I had found out, uh, when it comes to Overwatch tournaments, generally the licensing process itself, you don't even typically get a response until at least three months after you applied for your licensing. So for an Overwatch tournament specifically, you could apply for licensing, uh, do whatever planning you want, but in three months from then, you might end up getting a response of, hey, you don't actually have a license to produce this event. So then you have to start the process over. Um, so it, it all varies greatly from game to game, and it varies greatly depending on you know what type of base funding you actually have for an event. But two and a half months for an Overwatch event uh, run completely grassroots uh, was entirely unheard of. And we just uh, kind of got very, very lucky in uh, a lot of the networking that we did and in finding a lot of the people that we did uh, to get the right connections to make it happen within the timeline we wanted. I guess I have a question. What do you have yeah. planned for the future? Do you have other events coming up? Uh, so honestly, I don't personally have much planned for the future in esports uh, myself. Uh, I, I had been, as I said, I had competed in Rocket League for the past two years. Uh, my team that I was managing uh, was called Venus Vixens for a while. We ended up also, I was essentially running it as like a pseudo organization, uh, but it was really just a club where I was doing my best to teach uh, women in gaming about like the types of things that they would experience as they went on through their careers. And uh, I would teach them things like, what does a professional contract for a player really look like? Um, and things of that nature. Um, we ended up having a PUBG team as well as a Rocket League team at one point. We had considered going into other games, but um, essentially uh, I ended up getting the team uh, picked up by Torrent, who those of you in Minnesota might be familiar with. Uh, they just opened up their spot at the Mall of America. So I was on contract with them for the past year. My contract with them actually just expired on September 10th. Uh, so just a couple of days to go now. And uh, so at the moment, I'm just kind of a free agent. Um, with the Women's Carball Championship, uh, as much as I would like to be dedicating a much more of my time to them, uh, I'm unfortunately in a situation where I just don't have the means to volunteer for them as much as I used to. So I, I'm just essentially in a in a state right now of being a free agent and being an advisor for uh, for those who need. Uh, though I'm more than happy to take on additional independent contracts, and I would be more than happy to talk about those things if anyone is looking for anyone to help out with any sorts of events but i'm not like actively applying for uh for any events in esports really uh, so that's just kind of where i'm at <laughs> hey we know the peeps at wisdom gaming let's go yeah wisdom gaming is uh, a wonderful group of people love working with all of them yeah i'm pretty sure we have one of their staff in our stream tonight uh nancy hey <laughs> i will say wisdom gaming may or may not be the the one place i have actively applied for and they haven't gotten back to me on my my resume quite yet so if you're there and you're listening <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i felt like i had another question and now i can't um Oh, that's what it is. It's the same question I ask all of our speakers. Will you be able to hang out for a while after our next presenter to have some chats in the Minneapolis St. Paul room? As much as I would love to, I actually cannot tonight. Uh, after I'm done here, I actually need to go and pick up my partner from their uh, their college. They uh, are there waiting patiently from their last class to get picked up. <laughs> but otherwise, I, I definitely would. Awesome. Well, definitely stay engaged on the Discord and everything. It's great to have you and 
Uh, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Thank you again so much for joining us. I really loved your presentation and it will be up on our YouTube. So if you have anyone that you want to refer it to, you just send them that link and they can check it out later. Absolutely. And again, if anyone uh, who's here does come up with any questions later that they're like, oh man, I wish I would have thought about that. Just feel free to send me an email, uh, contact at freyahays.com. And uh, unfortunately, YouTube is being weird and it won't let me throw anything in the chat, so I can't drop that there. But uh, if any of you are interested in, in doing that, just let me know. Uh, I'll uh, always respond within 24 hours. Awesome. Well, definitely, uh, Peter says drive safe. I agree. Make sure. Thank you. I will. <laughs> Thank your partner also for putting up with a little bit of a delay for us. We appreciate it. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure he knows. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Right. Yes. Thank you. Have a great uh, rest of your night. And uh, I'll be sure to come back and watch the rest of the presentations later. Awesome. All right. Thank you. So we will take a short intermission here um, just while I make sure that our, oh, it looks like our other presenters are in stream. Uh, can we uh, get a hello just to make sure we get the present? <laughs> welcome, welcome. All right, so um, we have some folks from Below Zero, the Landfest chapter in Minnesota. So I'm just going to let them take it away. I'm going to mute myself and sit here patiently. <laughs> All right, so how should we start this up? Should we do introductions? Uh, Firestorm, you go first. You got to introduce yourself. So I'll let okay, you take so it. I'm Firestorm191. Um, I've been a gamer ever since I was a little kid. I mean, it's always, games have always uh, been a huge thing for me. Like, you know, I remember when I was young, I was on, I mean, I, I, I played like the Nintendo handhelds, you know, all that, and uh, Nintendo 64 and. Uh, all that, and I was super into it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've been playing games ever since I was super young, and um, yeah, it's really cool to be a part of, uh, you know, a um, a, a national uh, gaming organization. You know, we where we set up like events and stuff. I mean, it's just so cool. But anyway, Barbie, you can go on with your. <laughs> okay. If you like. So I'm Abuse Barbie, but my real name is Danica Clifton. I am uh, 28, almost 29 next month. Um, yeah, I could buy to 20s. <laughs> um, I've been gaming on the PC since I was about 13 years old. My first computer game legitimately was probably Diablo 2. I got really stuck on Diablo 2. It was like my ultimate diehard favorite number one favorite game. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Wasn't really a big fan of Diablo 3. I don't know if anybody's played that or not. If you played Diablo 2 to Diablo 3, you could tell the difference. But um, anyways, um, uh, I am the chapter admin for Landfest, and Landfest is pretty much a uh, nonprofit charity organization. And what it is, is it's different states. Uh, there's a lady, her name is Katie Briggs, and pretty much she is the president of uh, Landfest in general. And we have Chief, Opera uh, Chief Operations Officer Bridget Reese along with a board of directors as well, which is a long list of names, which I could probably spew out. But, you know, I don't expect you guys to remember all this. But it, regardless, anyways, um, with that being said, we have um, 400 volunteers, probably more now than before being updated with a healthy community. Um, and it's also we're revolved around esports as well um, with our Landfest event. We have a bunch of tournaments that we do which with each land fest event. And when we refer to chapters, we're referring to kind of like states. So if I do say like, oh, this is the chapter for Minnesota, that means the state. So this is the chapter for New York. It's just the state reference. I know I've had a few, few people confused by that. But um, <clears throat> anyways, we do have um, our own production services, which is full stream and network configuration. We have fundraising. We have workshops. Uh, workshops involve like... Uh, PC builds and stuff like that. And all this stuff takes place during the Landfest event. So what it is, is pretty much, let's say if you take a state and you want to do a Landfest event where you kind of want to like bring your own computer with your friends and stuff like that, Landfest kind of helps you build that in a sense with a nonprofit charity organization and kind of gives staff and builds you up from the ground up. So if we take place to where 
when I, this probably took place about five years ago, I attended my very first Landfest event. And um, this was over in Sacramento. I'm from California. So this happened like five or six years ago. And I remember one of my buddies, uh, we were playing CSGO. And we've been longtime partners, about 10 years. And we finally decided to meet in person. He's like, hey, there's this Landfest event. It's like bring your own computer, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, I've never heard of that. That's weird. Like, that sounds awesome. So I drove seven hours to go to this Landfest event and he bought my ticket. It was a $50 ticket and um, it was a three day event nonstop. And uh, when I showed up, it was actually really mind boggling because there was over around 200 people in this building and it was in the building of Intel. So we were actually at the Intel building in Sacramento and it was literally people would sleep at their computers. It was just insane. I just never saw anything like it. And I became obsessed with it. I remember spending the three days there and it was just uh, probably one of the happiest moments I've ever been in my life. And from there on out, I ended up moving to Minnesota. And when I moved out here, I kind of uh, was just, you know, like meeting a bunch of pc gamers and just i was a casual gamer i didn't really know anybody from california i had like no friends because i always stay inside and i play video games um i remember reaching out to landfest in general and i sent an email and i was like hey my name's danica i'm just curious i see you guys have different states and the closest state is colorado for a landfest event why do you guys not have a landfest event here in minnesota so (laughs) The president, Katie, she messaged me back. She's like, good question, Danica. We would actually like you to run the whole entire Landfest event here in Minnesota and create the whole <laughs> create the whole entire Landfest event. I was shocked. I was like, what? <laughs> so pretty much it was just kind of mind boggling to take in. And at the time, I didn't even meet Firestorm yet. This was just me being by myself. And uh, so I they gave me some specific things actions to do so i had to find around like i think like six or seven people to meet up in person and start a staff so that was to start the organization so what i did was i went out to minneapolis um but prior to that conversation i was on discord and i was on the minnesota Landfest discord and uh it was kind of hard to introduce yourself be like hey my name's danica i know you don't know me but can we meet in person and start this Landfest event that conversation was like really weird because most people don't want to meet in person you know what i mean like you don't know me i don't know you but hey let's like do this kind of thing and it was just a little bit weird for them and i was just really trying to push it i was like listen man i don't think you understand this is like a three-day gaming event like we could do some cool stuff and i i probably (laughs) seemed pretty crazy like i was like we need to do this so with that being said um i ended up finally getting i think it was like like seven to 10 people in this house. We decided a house in Minneapolis, somebody's house. And uh, we all met there. And this is where it just kind of was born. Katie flew out from California and another, I think it was the board of director. He flew out from Washington and they stayed at an Airbnb. And then we met up in the house and we all had our computer set up in this uh, gentleman's house. I wish I had photos to show you guys. I'm sorry. I don't have a slide, but anyways, uh, we kind of like were born that day. It was like three years ago. And uh, so that's when we all kind of discussed amongst each other, like, all right, so Abuse Barbie, you're going to be the chapter admin. And then we started kind of like giving everybody titles right there that day. And um, the, the, the tricky thing about this is, is our first launch. So we were prepping for this to do our first launch like three years ago, but it was actually going into the pandemic. And that was the rough part about it is we were supposed to do an in-person land fest, but we did not... We weren't prepared for, you know, the future of what was happening with COVID and so on and so forth. So what we did was kind of maneuvered around like what was going on. So we ended up doing an online land fest for our very first land fest event, which actually turned out pretty good. The downside about it is, is I wasn't able to participate because my um, motherboard pins um, were bent. And Firestorm could tell you about that. You want to you want to describe what we did that night where we were building our computer? Yeah, so, you know, she got this new case for her computer, right? And it's actually a really funny story. And uh, so, yeah, she got a new a new case. And, like, this was, like, one of the first times I had come over to her house at that time. And I was like, oh, yeah, I was so excited. You know, she got this case. She was so excited for her case. She wanted to put it in and everything. And I was like, listen, I can help you out with that. Like, I built my whole computer and all that and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, yeah, so... 
ended up somehow for some reason i decided that uh i was going to take out cpu and uh yeah we ended up well i ended up bending the prongs on her motherboard so the very next day of course she had this event planned and uh yeah i felt like the worst person in the world at that point because she didn't have a pc to do it on so um yeah we went straight down to that that next day we went down to micro center and we ended up i i had helped her you know go half on a new cpu she wanted to actually upgrade at that time too so you know i bought the motherboard completely and then she went half with well i went half on a new cpu with her as well too so yeah, just funny story. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was during our first launch, and uh, we actually had a um, a like a donation goal at the time, and I believe our first one was um, to I think it was breast cancer. Am I am I remembering this right? Was it breast cancer or Animal Humane Society? I, I'm not sure. I Usually, think. all proceeds pretty much go to all charity event for what our staff picks. So once when our staff kind of meets together, we we meet like um, Mondays every two weeks and then when the event gets closer we meet pretty much once a week every monday um but anyways um i just remember during the time with our first event it was just it was so sad because i really yeah. wanted to be there for my first event and i wasn't able to attend at all but i was there in spirit with my phone so i remember recording our trip uh you know remember broadcasting live i was in the passenger seat while we were driving on our way to micro center to what was it minneapolis that. i don't yeah, know exactly minneapolis micro center yeah yeah <laughs> and i was just like all right guys check it out i'm here but i'm like not there <laughs> so i wasn't able to do too much but it still was fun because we ended up hitting our two thousand dollar goal which was really phenomenal and we ended up doing a um I think somebody shaved their hair off <laughs> for two thousand dollars. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> I hear. I remember hearing about that. Yeah. 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 Somebody shaved their hair off once we hit the two thousand dollar goal, and uh, I think it was some kiddo who was probably around like fifteen or sixteen, and yeah. it was it was great. The whole community was great. They're all supportive, and I was super stoked for our first ever launch. We ended up hitting two thousand dollars. I was I was shocked. So, um. Anyways, fast forward time. Uh, work started getting really heavy on my side with my personal life. Uh, being a sous chef, you're working 14 hours a day, uh, six days a week. I was spending nights at hotels with just for my job and stuff like that. I couldn't take over. So I ended up contacting, um, you know, the land fest in general. I was like, hey, I don't know if I can operate it. Um, yada, yes, yada, this, yada, that. And then a gentleman named uh, Nathaniel ends up uh, messaging saying, hey, I can take over um, as chapter admin. So Nathaniel actually did last year, and last year was our very first in-person land fest. And uh, me and Firestorm were actually the ones who attended um, there in person. We were actually able to kind of grab our computers, you know, help out staff-wise and stuff like that. We were going to do productions, but our um, I think it was like a last minute notice where we couldn't get productions out. So with Landfest, they have different teams. It's actually really cool. They have um, staff volunteer management which pretty much has 28 events each year with local volunteers and they have panels. They bring in experts with tech and gaming industry to the event. Topics range from overclocking, internet safety, how to stream, et cetera. And with that being said, I do know the productions team usually flies out to different states. I was part of the productions team. I actually got to fly out to New York City and work with different states too as well. Um, but we didn't have it at Minnesota. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, this year we might get it or next year. But I'm trying to build a bigger platform for us. So. I'm hoping so should like we, should we talk about what we kind of have planned for this year or is that oh yeah not oh, something yes okay. no we need to tell we need to tell the world Absolutely. <laughs> yeah so, so I mean, you know a lot more than I do on that but yeah so pretty much um last year we were uh duck our, our event was called duck duck gray duck which I kind of thought was funny <laughs> But this year I named it and I called it Winter Wonderland. So oh. we're shooting for, or sorry, I'm sorry, Firestorm. <laughs> I take that back. Firestorm named it Winter Wonderland. I, we were both brainstorming and I felt like we both came up with the idea. It was a wonderful idea. Yeah, it was. And uh, so we're just, we're, our dates for our land fest is going to be December 9th, 10th, and 11th. And right now we are working on a venue 
So what we're doing right now, and I'll give you kind of like an inside window of what's going on. We're working with a gentleman named, gentleman named Peter, and he um, he ran 2DCon. I don't know if anybody's familiar with 2DCon. I know uh, Beth is. And um, I pretty much got a hookup through her, and that's how we met, and that's how I'm here now, speaking with a few people on YouTube. <laughs> but anyways... Um, we have a meeting coming up on the 18th. I know Katie's flying out with her husband, Katie, the president of Landfest. Uh, she's flying out with her husband on the 16th, the 17th at, uh, Minnesota, um, Mall of America. There's going to be called Be the Match and it'll be on site at Mall of America during the multiverse tournament, which apparently is like really awesome. I'm sorry. I got to lick this I up. Represent, it's, yeah. It yeah. Sorry, so it's Saturday at the beginning at 4 PM and it's 32 teams involved. Entry fee is $10 per person. Um, pretty much the cash pot will be two top teams, $224 for first place, $96 for second place. And it has to do with, um, the bone marrow, something to do with bone marrow, bone marrow charity. So, uh, the, the rest of the fundings will go to the bone marrow charity. So I'm like super excited for that. Yes. Peter from Minnesota esports club. Yes. Not our Peter. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Yes. Um, wonderful guy. He's awesome. I, I talked to him. He's great. Apparently his birthday on, is on the 17th. So that's why we're not able to meet on the 17th, but the 18th is when we're allowed to go meet with him. So me and firestorm, Katie and Gary, and I also have another staff ma member named Thaddeus. He will be joining us and we will be able to look out um, the layout. They don't have a blueprint of the venue. So we're going to have to like sketch this out on a notepad and kind of like rough draft it. Because when what we do is we have um, we have uh, specific teams within our land fest event. And what they do is like we have a budgeting team. We have a productions team. We have a team where they set up like how to sell the tickets, yada, yada. We just don't have a blueprint for this one. So what we have to do is we kind of have to like physically look at it and kind of sketch out. All right, we can put tables right here. Like six people could fit here. Six people could fit here, yada, yada, yada. So it's going to be quite interesting how that works. But do you um, think we should, sh should we show them? Like I saw, I remember you pulled up a video of one of the Landfest events. Do you think we should show them something like that or? Oh, I how it looks? Cool. Yeah. So yeah, I could show that... them the Sacramento one. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Sacramento awesome. one is the one I attended to. It was the, my first one. Um, let me find it. It was actually really crazy. I was surprised, like, how it went. Uh, I'm going to just share my screen, if that's okay. And then there we go. <laughs> and this is kind of just like a recap of what's going on. So as you can see, I don't know if you guys can see or not, but in this video, pretty much, you could see people lining up. They have their tags. When you do join this, um, let me turn down the volume just a little bit. When you do join this uh, event, what you do is you get a lanyard. Um, there's VIP tickets to upgrade to as well. You get bigger space to as well, and you get um, all sorts of goodies and treats. We, we worked with uh, Minnesota Rocker esports events and they came over um and they gave us a bunch of goodies to give out to everybody there too as well you check in with staff which would be like me firestorm thaddeus we'd all be working the computers kind of getting everybody in and situated we are sponsored by a lot of people uh one of the people being Landfest or uh intel and then razor and then cooler master and um there's so many i just i can't even spew them all out i'd have to look it up <laughs> i don't have it off the top of my head i just know those top three, because they're really good. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, you can see how the tables are set out. Everybody purchases a ticket um, and you kind of pick your seat on the website. And we have different workshops on the side. So like if you want to learn how to build a computer, you can literally take your time out of your day. So it's a three day nonstop event. That means there's it goes through the night all the way through. And what happens is we have set things going on with our staff that we put up like um, workshops like or even like side uh we'll have a console on the side and we'll have like um i don't know like mario kart and you can play mario kart and whoever wins you know mario kart you get a new yeah. gaming racing chair or uh you know mortal kombat i remember i played mortal kombat just to just to win a um a, a motherboard and they'll and, and it really just depends like on the staff and what we can provide the more tickets we sell the more better prizes we can give out so our last event we actually gave out 
was it a processor? We gave out a processor, a Ryzen, uh, or a Razer gaming chair. Uh, I actually won a PC case that was worth like a hundred bucks just for showing up, you know, and uh, winning a Call of Duty tournament. So that was pretty cool. But um, I don't. I it's just it's really cool to get everybody involved, and I'm a huge person with like trying to get everyone involved. I'm a very social person, so this is like a lot to me to like. Be, in, be involved in this, especially with charity. It's just really huge. So I absolutely love it. <laughs> well, and you've always kind of been like that kind of like, even like before we, like just as friends, you've always kind of been the one like, hey, let's all get together and do some fun stuff. So I mean, yeah, you're definitely perfect for the position, I would say. Yeah, I always try and grab people's attention because I know we can all get distracted or we're, we get wrapped up in things. But I always try and grab people's attention to come back into reality and kind of like, be like, hey, we have this event coming on. You should like meet us in person. I'm always just like a social butterfly when I need to be. But I'm also can be an introvert, too, as well. So it kind of goes both yeah. way, hands in hands. <laughs> well, that's the thing. What about, thinking... what about you, Firestorm? Are you like, how do you feel about the whole entire uh, Landfest event? Like, are you? Are you I think it's going to be here? awesome. No, I'm really excited. I mean you know like i know we're working on our flyers now and uh all that and um you know as of right now things you know we're just we're still kind of in the process for setting up like this year's event um you know me as a staff leader i'm more of just kind of work i mean you know barbie i will say you do most of the the coordinating and the you know and all that um really i know that i don't do a whole lot besides sit here and you know you tell me hey i gotta do this i gotta do that and i'll you know what i'll get it done let's do it so i'm more of a helper than anything but i know but um, that still helps so scott yeah, says yeah. how many people at the land fest land event um it, so the one i just showed you the sacramento there was around 250 people it was pretty big but we've had bigger. I just flew out to New York City. Uh, sorry, I'm stumbling on my words. New York City. <laughs> and uh, we had, I think they had around like 300. And they usually get around four to 500 on a good on a good land fest. And their facility is massive. Like they use the fairgrounds. So they have an open wide, like massive, I don't know, venue where it's just where people could bring their tents and their sleeping bags and their air mattresses. And then you'll have people who are into clans who are like, they'll start putting like um, neon lights with their clan name on it and they'll just get really into it. It's just amazing like what these people do and how creative people can be. Um, so last year we ended up having, I think, 25 attendees um, for our first, you know, face to face launch, like in person launch. And that was at the Great Wolf Lodge, which actually was not even that bad of a venue. The only fun. downside was that we had to pack up pretty early. And um, that's what we're kind of discussing right now with Great Wolf Lodge. We were talking to the CEO. Um, if we can uh, make it where we have pretty much uh, gaming available till like 3 a.m. Because packing up till like midnight or so, that's kind of the peak hours where we're all gaming. So I was just like, hey, you know, is there any way we could change this? And apparently Texas for Great Wolf Lodge, they game throughout three days. So we're just trying to get um, Minnesota involved. It's a different state, so maybe different regulations, different owners, and so on and so forth. So we're kind of pending an email. We already had a meeting with Great Wolf Lodge, so we're waiting on an email from them. And then we're also waiting for Peter to as well. So we're kind of we're on the fence right now with two venues before we move uh, forward. And then once we move forward, then we can get our flyers out. Then we could start telling everybody about like the event and like when it's going to happen and so on and so forth. Has there been one in Minnesota yet? Yes, there was. There was one last year um, and it was in November. <clears throat> Do land staff team cross pollinate? Do you collab with AWOL land in Wisconsin or anything? No. So, we, so we're kind of separate. So it's just like, it goes by like chapters, like I said earlier. So, I'm going to tell you guys, um, I'm going to, I'm going to list off pretty much each state what's going on. It's going to be a lot of states, but I'm going to tell you where Landfest is at in each state. So we're kind of across the platform in states. So I'll start off with, uh, so we have one in Arizona, we have Atlanta, Georgia, we have Albany, New York, Buffalo, New York, Rochester, New York, Austin, Texas, Dallas, Texas, Pomona, California, Sacramento, California, Chicago, Illinois, Castle Rock, Colorado. 
Everett, Washington, Puyallup, Washington, Fort Wayne, Indiana, St. Louis, Missouri, Boston, Massachusetts, Hill, Hillsbor- Hillsboro, Oregon. I'm probably butchering it. I'm sorry. Champsburg, <laughs> Pennsylvania, Tampa, Florida, and then, of course, us, Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's all the chapters that we do have right now across the state. And um, if you do not hear your state and you want to start one, you're more than welcome to. And we can actually help you start as a chapter admin and um, kind of build up from there. So we're kind of scattered around everywhere. <laughs> love it. But yeah. <laughs> and I love how, like, in, you know, how even though we've only, as a Minnesota land fest, we've only kind of been going for a couple of years, I love the progress that we've made from you know, doing an online event to, you know, now doing in-person events. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see kind of where we go in the next even few years, you know, like I'm super excited for that. And, you know, I, uh, like, it'd be cool to have like, um, flyers up, you know, in like Walmarts and, you know, like all across the state. I mean, that'd just be so cool. And being a part of like county fairs and stuff, I, I just think that that was, you know. That so that I, would be awesome. Yeah, that's my yeah. biggest one. If we could get a stand out in a, like the fair and just start yeah. handing out flyers, I would be there all day long. <laughs> be like, check it out, guys. <laughs> I think that would be so yeah. awesome. I think, I feel like this year, so with this year, our dates, like I said, December 9th, 10th, and 11th is when our goal date is. I feel like it's going to be bigger than 25. And the reason why I say that is I feel like I'm just going to push a little bit harder to get our um, information out. So last year, I ended up actually driving myself to Micro Center and handing out flyers and stuff like that myself in the front door. So when everybody entered in, I was like, hey, I'm not trying to sell anything. I just want to let you know there's a charity event going on and it's a Landfest event. Event, Bring your own computer, this and that. But like... Um, for some reason, like we've built a bigger platform with more staff this year. So I feel like it's going to be more active and I feel I have a feeling we'll kind of expand our horizon in a sense. So I'm hoping that we'll sell like, you know, 40 tickets maybe this year, maybe 50. Who knows? And yeah. it really also depends on our venue, too. Yep. And it's also nice to have that online portion of it, too, you know, to be able to interact with people online, like, you know, if they can't make it there and stuff like that. So that's a really cool aspect that is is involved with this whole process too. So I love it. Yeah, we did uh we did do a hybrid event last year. We did do console with PC. But the only downside about that was a lot of the console players could not cross play with the PC players. So we did have some tournaments because we always do run tournaments with Landfest. Um there was no cross compatibility with some of the winning prizes unfortunately. So it kind of was like a bummer for some console players, which I kind of felt really bad about. <laughs> so I think we're going to mainly focus on PC gaming just in general. It w- We still are obviously allowing console players to come and join and buy a ticket if they want to or whatever. And we will be having um, computers set up too as well that are open to the public. So if you were just walking around and you somehow see like the event going on, you could actually come downstairs and just join in and hop in on a game. And it's actually for free. You don't even have to pay for a ticket. That's just a game in general. That's not participating, obviously, in the prizes, prizes and stuff like that. But it's still like you're able to join the community of what we're doing and figure out like who we are and what, what we are and what we're doing, which is really awesome. And we'll have a few consoles, uh, consoles too as well set up. So I'm pretty excited about that. Me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I would I would have loved this in college. Advertise around un- universities with gaming clubs. That's a great idea, actually. We should write that down on our notepad. Pick up whole groups, whole groups of like five, ten people at once. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, colleges. <clears throat> I hear like high schools are the place to hit up. Apparently, like just to go and you know shoot yeah. information about it and stuff like that. I never thought of colleges though. That would be really good. Yeah, that would be really good. Actually, we should bring that to our discord and let them know yeah for sure go to your local college (laughs) no absolutely (laughs) 
I'm trying to think of other ways to like get the word out. So we do have like social media, which can only go so far. And then you have handing out flyers. And then I remember last year we ended up handing out flyers to like the local, uh, pretty pretty much like Magic of the Gathering, um, like your, uh, I yeah. don't know, like those shops and stuff like that. I remember uh, posting Creating flyers. Card on, shops, yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't know if that helped or not, but we still got the word out, so it was really good. Go to the local arcades and just play their games and be the guy yeah. with the below zero shirt on, you know? Seriously. <laughs> I'm really excited, though, to actually... What, is he, what do you say? I would have loved... Oh, I'm really excited to um, actually go to the Mall of America and try out this uh, tournament. I'm, like, super stoked. <laughs> yeah, so have you played the multiverses before? No, I have no idea about my I remember talking to you about it when uh, Panda and I were playing it. I told you to hop on. You can always share your event info with the I IGDATC community too. Absolutely, and we will definitely do that. Um, yeah, no, that multiverse should be... So I'm assuming you, you get a character and then you just kind of like, is it like Mortal Kombat in a so sense? So it's not like an RPG element to it. You have like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo on there and like DC characters mostly. You have Superman and Batman, and, you know, and like okay. not even just superheroes, but just all these other characters. And it's like Super Smash Bros. Melee. How, oh, know, it's man. A okay. It's a platform game. Yeah. So it gets to be uh, pretty intense. Like camping? Right on. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Well, hopefully, like, I can't wait. Well, we're gonna have already computers set up too as well. So the event starts at 4 p.m. at Mall of America, but we'll be there at 10 a.m. to help set up. And what we're doing is setting up all the computers and stuff like that. So hopefully, we can get random people from Mall of America. Well, they don't want me to I touch those like computers. Snagging. I'll bend their motherboard pins. Well, hopefully, you learned from <laughs> last time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Jeez. that won't happen i'm not gonna open yeah we'll, we'll see we'll see about yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh me and firestorm we're like main i'm a main fps player like i did play diablo 2 but i jumped into a lot of fps and i've been fps my whole life and it's really like hard to come by uh females who are into fps because you don't see too many. You're seeing more now. I, I feel like I'm seeing more now than I have before. But it's really awesome. And then Firestorm's also FPS too as well. So like he he broadens his horizon way more than I do. So that's why I ask him about all these other games. I'm like, so what's this about? And what's that about? Right now my main binge is Call of Duty. And then I'm slowly trying to get into Tarkov. But it's a struggle. But I'm, <laughs> I'm into Call of Duty. And I know he's into Tarkov a lot. So I'm just trying to hone in on now. that game. You know, As of right now, yes, and we jump around. I get around. these little flings, you know. I jump around to this game for a bit, and then this game, you know, it's it's gaming is just so beautiful. You can't just narrow yourself down to like one category, you know. You have to you have to enjoy them all because that's what they're there for, and that's what I love about it, you know. That kind of reminds me of Doc, how he kind of jumps around from different game to game. He's a good aspiration to like gaming. Absolutely. I just like, I'm like, I'm like, wow, dude. He's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, he's a good streamer. For sure. <laughs> Intense, yeah. <laughs> you should, Shane. You need to go. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we'll be updating, obviously, um, IGDA TC with more info once the events go uh, further. And we also have, obviously, Blow Zero uh, Discord as well. Um, and all that and social media. Yeah, um, Blow Zero Landfest is the URL. So if you just type in discord.gg forward slash below zero landfest. That is the discord to that one. And you're more than welcome to see our updates and what staff is working on and kind of where we're at and when our launch is at and when we have set dates and so on and so forth. So that way you guys can t uh, attend the event and kind of keep updated with what we're all going through. So it's a really cool process. <laughs> Takes time, that. but it'll get there <laughs> for sure. Anything else you want to talk about, Firestorm? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think we've pretty much talked about most of uh, what's going on this year, right? Yeah, pretty much. Anyway. And last year, what happened last year? <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, did you, I mean, how much did you go into depth about your New York thing? How was that? Oh, the productions? Yes. 
So I I ended up so with Landfest, you can sign up as pretty much almost and they're always hiring in a sense or like sorry, not hiring, but volunteering. They do have some hiring positions, by the way. I'm just not too sure what it is. So don't quote me on it. But um, there is volunteering always all the time. And if you go to landfest.com, um, I did end up signing up with the productions team because I was out of work for a while uh, due to waiting on surgery. Um, I ended up having surgery, getting rid of my belly button. It's not my choice. I kind of had no option, so I don't have a belly button. Sorry to weird you guys out. <laughs> but with that being said, while I was waiting, uh, I decided to join productions because productions team, pretty much you're going to be working with these people who kind of like fly you out to different states or different chapters is what they call them, different chapters uh, with who we work with. And your job is pretty much to work with, um, I don't know if you guys ever streamed, but um, like uh, Streamlabs or whatever, they kind of use that platform in a sense. They use uh, something different than Streamlabs. I can't remember the name of it, but it's... Do you remember the name? What I said? Is it is it, is it OBS? Studios? No, not OBS. It's made for like four or five cameras, so it can handle that mm. many cameras. I just can't remember the name of it. Oh, I remember. It was you a really good about product, it, yeah. though. It was really awesome. It was really great for like what they were doing. So pretty much, you got to work with like professional cameras. And I had no experience. Like this is me with no experience. And I got to fly out there, and it was an amazing experience. And this is where I got to see uh um pretty much what it was like over at this uh, land fest and they they usually ran about like 500 people so during covid they were down to like 250 so they were half of what they usually do um but with that being said it was still an amazing amazing time and i got to sit there with a camera on my shoulder looking like i knew what i was doing but even though i wasn't that great but i was still like you know i was just like all right just keep building that computer you're doing great even though i didn't what I was probably zooming in or out too much or shaking too much, but they were really I awesome. What that video looked like, yeah, it was great. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> it's the best. Yeah, <laughs> it was the bees knees. It, it, I mean, to, just to be honest, I probably wouldn't do any better. I've never even like seen one of those like you know one of those big cameras in person. Oh yeah, so. they were. It was crazy to hold it. I was like terrified. I was like, all right, I'll just hold this. And I had to hold it for like three or four hours because uh, we, like I said, we had a workshop going on where it's build your own computer. So we had, um, I think it was like seven people who bought a PC, um, a pre, not a pre-built PC, but a PC that was disassembled. So all parts were shipped to, to the people who bought it. And pretty much the video was about, um, the live video was us kind of going together how to build this computer together. So we all did, the, we did the components together, the case, the fan, the CPU, the motherboard, the RAM sticks, blah, 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 blah. And you kind of just got to sit there and, and build it as we were building it at the same time and explaining like what we were doing at the same time. And it was really cool. Like I That's thought cool. it was the coolest. Yeah. I thought it was so cool. I was like, what in the world? And I think it was like only $600 for the whole entire computer build. Oh wow. So it was, to yeah, it was ridiculous. It was like six or $700. Um, dollars. It wasn't even that bad for like what was going on with the graphics card situation and everything. It was mind boggling. So, what does he always pick up land crude anyways what's a little extra covid <laughs> seriously <laughs> but um it was it was cool to do productions especially with no experience and i got to learn about a software program that i wasn't aware of um and they fly you out you don't pay for your flights they pay for the hotel they pay for the flights it's just giving your time and actually sitting there and just kind of um kind of working and watching this Landfest event go down and watching people game. I mean, you are working most of the time as productions because you want to capture every moment of the Landfest event, but you're flying out to different states and you're kind of experiencing all these nuances of, of stuff going on and you're just kind of intrigued and you're like, wow, like this is crazy. I didn't know this state had this or I didn't know this state was like this. And it's just, it's such an amazing experience. It's like a euphoric high that I get when I did it. And I'm just like, Oh, but I ended up having to stop it due to going back to work and I was recovering from surgery and so on and so forth. But that was super fun. So if you guys are interested, sign up for protections on Landfest. It's absolutely fun. If you have the time, they would definitely take you in with no experience needed. Just FYI. But if you have experience, that's definitely a bonus. <laughs> It is so much fun, Zoe. Super fun. Super. <laughs> it's gonna be cool to be able to like introduce like different like 
you know, like obviously right now with the Minnesota Land Fest, like we did the tournaments last year, but it's going to be cool to find like different ways, like you had said, like the PC building aspect of it, you know, doing like different just ways to interact with different people and um, instead of just tournaments or whatever, um, you know, it's going to be, I don't know, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, I think the more we build, the bigger this will get. Because if you think about it, the only thing that I've seen Landfest related that I found was 2D Con, which I just recently found out, like not even that long ago, probably what, like a month ago. I didn't even know it existed. And um, that was probably the only thing I found for Landfest event. And then you have the Minnesota Esports, but I'm not too sure if that's like a proper Landfest event. Do you know what I mean? It's more like a competitive aspect. Like, don't get me wrong, Landfest does have his uh, have its competitive aspects for sure, but um, it's more family revolved. So like, um, you'll have kid games. I remember we had a competitive game where you had to pressure wash, like you. It was a pressure washing simulator, I think. And oh, yeah. The best. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. It's all like, it's family oriented and we, we keep it that way. We always try to keep it um, pretty much PG as much as we can. We've never really had any incidences at all, apparently. This is what I've been told by Katie herself um, throughout all states, which have like been phenomenal. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's just, I, I love the whole entire thing about it. I've been obsessed with it for a while and uh, I'm just really excited to bring people in person and kind of like watch people game next to you and be able to game with them and then kind of just like take your headset off and be like, Hey, like, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> <laughs> like, I love that. Like that just blows my mind that we can do that nowadays. And we're here in 2022 and we can like we can build a community like that and do that. It just blows my mind. It, yeah. It's crazy. You know, it's kind of funny though, because like the whole idea of gaming or at least like online gaming is to be able to play with people around the world. But like with Landfest, you just get everyone together and it's just so much more fun that way too. I mean, you know, just, just to be able to play these games with these people right next to them and just, you know, have fun with them for their, for a few days. And, you know, I mean, like last the last one um you know we we have actually a lot of friends that are involved in all of this so like we got to see some people that we don't normally get to see all the time which is really cool so it's you know it's a really cool event where everyone just gets gets together and just has a blast gaming and yeah it's lovely yeah it's only once a year and that's it like three days just yeah <laughs> be a nerd <laughs> <laughs> and if you guys have any ideas for like workshops, like uh, a tournament for something like we had, um, what was it? We had Cowboy Bebop. It was brand new that came out on Netflix, the live action Cowboy Bebop. We had that on a projector screen um, going consistently while we were gaming as well. So people could just stop and watch, you know, uh, Cowboy Bebop while they were gaming or don't game and watch that or vice versa and so on and so forth. And and then obviously upstairs there was a bar for the adults so they can go drink on their own terms and then come back down and yada yada. And then we also have staff to make sure things are okay and nothing's going chaotic. Everything's always usually moderated uh, by all staff too as well. So things never really get too out of hand and it's pretty chill. So yeah, I don't really have anything else to say. <laughs> <laughs> I think that kind of sums up everything we talked about. I think so. All the stuff that we talked about, yeah. Uh, let's see. I personally would love to see some of our locally made indie games there. That would be pretty yes! cool, too. Yes! We could do a tournament off of it. That would be so cool. Absolutely. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> that would be great. We could totally fill a slot in for your indie games. I think that would be great if we could collab together. That would be so awesome. Absolutely. We always, so our prizes work pretty much the more tickets we sell, the prizes are bigger. So we are sponsored by plenty of people. I wonder if I could pull it up right now and see how I can spew out some stuff real quick. Hold on. Give me one second. Uh, So let's see our sponsors. So we have Intel, we have ViewSonic Elite, we have MSI. We have ARC, V1 Tech, Cooler Master, Fan AI, 
uh, Be Quiet FSP, Glorious PC Gaming Race, In Win, Razor, Steel Series, Thermal Take, Viper Gaming by Patriot, Wicked Audio, Zalman, Zotac Gaming, Raw Furry, which is a game dev sponsor, and then tech sponsors is Discord, System in Place, and then this one, this is Cyber War, which I've never heard of. So yeah, Beth says, any other questions for our amazing speakers? Anybody have any questions? Are we good? Are we golden? Did <laughs> yeah, I cover seems, everything? Seems like nobody has any more questions, but uh, I did want to jump into voice and say, yeah, the indie game tournament, I don't know if Peter's still in the stream, but that is one thing that he has been like super passionate about is trying to get our indies in some tournaments, uh, like our, our games in some tournaments. Uh, that's one of the things we've been pitching places because it would be super fun. There's a lot of really good like multiplayer or uh, like fighting type games. Uh, Lane said Clawbreaker. Oh, that's a, like a that's a I think that's a begin began at Midwest Game Jam 2016 or something 2015. Oh wow, so, yeah. I mean, okay. there's, there's a lot of games that maybe aren't released that would be really really fun to do in a like tournament style. Um, so yeah, yeah, if there's any way <laughs> that you know how to implement it as a tournament style, absolutely let us know. We'll take the feedback and discuss it with staff. And if we can make it into a tournament, we definitely would. Because right now, I think uh, we're working with somebody to do a tournament with. Was it with Cooler Master? Um, uh, a representative for Cooler Master? I think we have to do like one separate tournament for them. And then uh, they give out their own prizes. But other than that, our board is kind of open. Like we have... Um, the only thing that we've discussed for like tournament wise is I know I mentioned uh, I definitely want to implement uh, Call of Duty because I, I love Call of Duty. So I'm just like, oh, let's go. And then uh, Apex po possibly, but I'm not too sure if you can do Apex. I don't know enough about Apex if you do a tournament. Um, I know CSGO for all the FPS players too as well was another possibility. Rocket League too as well is a big one. Um Clawbreaker is easy tournament because of the rounds are like one minute long. Oh, wow. I didn't even know that. That's crazy. I got to look into this. I've never even heard of it. I don't know. Is that one out on itch? Maybe. I don't know. We'll have to. There's there, there's like a whole I have a collection that uh, one of our previous chairs had made like uh, locally made games, Minnesota made games on itch. And I just kind of like keep watching and like little things will show up. But it's really cool. There's like a all sorts because they're like game jam games all the way up to like polished more finished type stuff so yeah that'd be cool that'd be so awesome because if you think about it three days straight like that's a lot of time to implement a lot of tournaments or just even fun tournaments without even a prize even if it's a prize it could be like a mouse pad or something you know like silly or whatever it is or just bragging rights i remember i did a, a csgo tournament at Landfest in sacramento there was no specific prize but it was more of like bragging rights of who got to be the best CSGO team at the time. But with that being said, if you buy a ticket for LandFest, you're already automatically drawn into a raffle. Like you already are submitted in. And at my first LandFest event, I actually won a PC case, another PC case that was worth like $200. And there was a full build computer that they gave away too, just for attending and you get a raffle. Like this is just stuff that we give out just because you show up and you support us just by buying a ticket. This is not even entering the tournaments. The tournaments are another thing that's kind of like where we have to figure out if we got to split it between all members, how big are the party? Like, is it four people who are winning five people? What can we give them all, you know, as a tournament? So it'd be kind of interesting to get into uh, detail with that game and see like how it operates, how many people are in a game and so on and so forth. So that'd be cool. All right. So Lane does have a question now. Do you play board games there at all? Yes. Actually, last year we had a live D&D &D, um, board game and there was about five people who were playing um, kind of near the midst around like. 10 p.m. or so so yes we do um we wanted to implement a little bit more board games but we do definitely so if you ever want to do board games or have a specific board game please let us know and we'll def definitely take it into consideration and talk about staff if we can implement it into uh pretty much uh our schedule and right now like i said our schedule is like open right now we don't have really anything set in stone because we are just waiting on the venue once we get a venue set in place, that's when everything's just going to kind of fall into line. So right now is the best time to give us like all the ideas you can think of, whatever games, 
yada, yada, yada. And then we could just kind of like plug it in. <laughs> well, we had a pretty good showing at our 2D con. We sponsored the Indie Island there. So there was, I think, like 23 games and most uh, there was only six digital and the rest were board games. So, oh, wow. Uh, we got lots, lots of stuff under development here. Yeah, that's cool. Heck yeah. Man. All right. <laughs> All right. So I think we're I think we're winding down. Do y'all have any last pitches or uh, how can we contact you if we have suggestions, feedback, et cetera? Well, uh, pretty much, uh, we're always in the Below Zero Land Fest. So if you ever want to kind of get into contact with us, if you go to um, discord.gg forward slash below zero land fest, it's just kind of one word, or look up abused Barbie uh, hashtag 4956. Um, you can personally DM me or just check out IGDA Twin Cities Discord. I'll be in there. <laughs> um, I also stream. Just twitch.tv forward slash abuse Barbie. Uh, Facebook, same thing, abuse Barbie. It's pretty self explanatory. Abuse Barbie all around. <laughs> but um, that's how you can contact me. Um, my email is abusebarbie at gmail.com um, as well. And um, yeah. Awesome. So, last question for you Are you sure. able to hang around in the Minneapolis St. Paul room after the stream here? Um, I don't think so because I probably have to eat dinner. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that's it's totally eight. fair. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I'll have it on my phone up, but it probably won't be active, so I can just kind of linger. Yeah, yeah, you, you can. I'll just linger. In. I'll linger, but I just I can't promise you that I'm going to be super active. No, that's fine. That's fine. All right, so I guess we're going to bring this meeting to a close. Thank you both again for coming and speaking to us about LandFest. I'm super excited at the possibilities of some indie collab with y'all and can't wait to see where your venue is and everything. Absolutely. Take care. Yep. Good night. Bye. Good night. <laughs>